Hi, my name is Lily and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be doing an autism Q&A based on the questions submitted to me by you guys over on Twitter. So before we begin, I should just say um, I am autistic. I am 22 years old. I was diagnosed when I was 20 years old, so please bear that in mind when I answer these questions and try to remember the context. While I answer these questions, they're going to be all from my own personal experience. They are not meant to answer for all autistic people or to try and represent a general autistic experience. I should also just say, I apologize now for not having as fun a backdrop. I know that this video is going to make me anxious at times, so I've decided to film in a location I feel more comfortable, which is on my sofa with some cushions and a blanket and yeah I've got my stress ball nearby and a few other stim things so that if I need to take a break I can so don't worry if I look sad or upset or distressed in this video I am trying to take steps to look after myself as well. So before I get into the questions I just wanted to give you a quick roundup of autism just in case you don't know all that much about it. So autism is a neurological condition where our brains are basically built different to neurotypical people. It is not something that is contagious, it is generally believed to be something that is genetic and you are autistic from birth. It may not be discovered until later on in life and basically a way to explain it from a neuroscience point of view is that when you are doing tasks, your brain parts, often there are multiple brain parts working together to do one thing. And in autistic people, those connections are not quite as strong between different parts of the brain, but the connections within each part of the brain are very strong. So for example, having a conversation with someone involves talking, listening, looking for body language, looking for facial expressions, trying to tune out other noises going on around you and so much more. And that involves lots of different parts of the brain. So for a neurotypical person, that's fine because their brain can combine all those parts together. But for an autistic person, it's much more difficult to connect all of those things at once. But if you were just asking someone to say record a speech on something they're very interested in and they're autistic, they probably excel at that because they only have to engage that one part of their brain that's thinking and talking about the thing that they love. So that's kind of a good way to explain it. It is a neurodivergence. It's not something that can be cured and it's not going to go away into adulthood, but some of the features and uh, characteristics can change and develop over time. So if you want to know more about what autism is, I recommend you go and look at some reliable websites, for example, the NHS website. Try to avoid places that are not written in a sensitive kind of way. But yeah, I will try and link down some videos below that explain autism better, particularly Paige Lael. She does a really good explanation of what autism is by going through the diagnostic manual. So that's something I would really encourage you to go and watch and I will link below if that is something you're interested in. So I'm expecting this video is going to be quite long because I do have quite a few questions to get through. I have broken them down into categories and I will try to remember to timestamp those categories down below so you can choose what you want to listen to if you don't want to listen to all of it in one go. I will give a warning that I probably will be talking about ableism and some negative experiences around autism. So if you are autistic yourself and you find that triggering, maybe consider not giving this video a watch if that's going to affect you in any way. The categories I'm going to be going through are diagnosis, relationships, daily life, media, and then a general questions at the end from once I couldn't fit into those categories. This is the order I thought made most sense and I have also ordered the questions in a kind of organic order to make them follow on very well. So hopefully this will be nice and smooth for you watching. Also I apologize, the ring light is gonna be reflecting in my glasses, but as a glasses wearer, it's very difficult to get a ring light or any kind of light in a way that's not gonna reflect badly, so. It's just something we're gonna have to deal with. I hope it's not too distracting. I thought I'd start with a question that is very interesting to me and is a good place to start. And that is, did you notice any signs that made you think you might be autistic? And as someone who was diagnosed into adulthood, it kind of, I don't wanna sound mean, but yes, obviously I did because I sought the diagnosis. And I should say, I was actually seeking an autism diagnosis. I didn't go to the doctor saying like, I think I'm different. I think there's something wrong and they came up with the autism diagnosis, I sat in front of the doctor and said, I think I might be autistic and I would like to see if I can get diagnosed. Um, I guess it's hard to say which ones individually made me think of it because my story is a little bit different. Growing up, I went to a school that was an integrated school with uh, children with disabilities. So within our school, we had special little sections where disabled children would be able to go and do some additional supported learning, but for the most part, they were integrated into our classes. And in my early primary school years, especially, 
all of my friends were in some way diagnosed as special needs or had learning disabilities. Most of them were autistic or uh, extremely dyslexic. So I think very early on that should have been a sign that I might have also been autistic because all of my friends had some kind of learning disability or neurodivergence and that was the only real group of friends I ever properly gelled with throughout my entire childhood. So that was probably an early sign but I remember when I was about 13 or 14 I started to think I might be a bit different because I've been bullied for like pretty much my whole life and you know your parents will always say oh it's because you're so much smarter than them and they're jealous but you know that's not true. So I was watching, I think it was Embarrassing Bodies, which used to be a show on the on Channel 4 in the UK, and they would occasionally have quizzes up on their website, and they had one about autism. And I went through and did the quiz, and it said there was a very strong likelihood that I had autism, and basically from them, I kind of thought I was probably autistic, but I kind of shelved it in the back of my mind, because my parents didn't want to go and seek a diagnosis at that time. But then I got into university and I could see I wasn't coping the same way other people were, and I was really struggling with things that I didn't realise other people struggle didn't struggle with. So things like being overwhelmed by noise. Um, like one big thing I remember is uh, in a restaurant, I can't read a menu if someone else on my table is talking. So often that would mean, especially as a child, I'd plug my ears so I could read my menu because if anyone talked, my brain would focus on the speech and I wouldn't be able to read. And it was little things like that that kind of reinforced it for me. So for the next part, it's kind of three questions put into one and it was, what age were you diagnosed? How did the process work? And how did the diagnosis process make you feel? So, I was diagnosed at 20 and I know the diagnosis processes vary wildly country to country and even region to region within countries. I have friends who were diagnosed as adults in the UK who went through an entirely different diagnosis process to me so bear that in mind when I tell you what my story was. So I went through the system up in York because I sought a diagnosis when I was um, at university which and I went to university in York. So. If you live in this area this could still be the process you may have to go through so what happened was i went to the doctor and said that i thought i might be autistic and she made me fill in a couple of questionnaires and they're kind of screening questionnaires to assess whether you may be autistic and they asked the kind of basic questions like do you struggle with eye contact do you struggle to recognize facial expressions little things like that that are kind of the most common traits that appear in people with autism and they score it and if you get above a certain score you get referred on to treatment not treatment you get referred on to diagnosis and that's what happened to me i scored very highly so i got sent off for a referral to a place that could do the diagnosis and where i lived the diagnosis could only be done by psychology professionals so it couldn't be done by my gp the waiting list was very long <laughs> i think so bearing in mind i started university at 19 years old I didn't get my diagnosis until I was 20 and like a half to try and give you the idea. So it was about 18 months it took from referral to the final diagnosis. So I had to wait quite a while before my first session. And it's a bit hazy for me because I do actually have a little bit of PTSD and trauma surrounding my diagnosis because I found it a very unpleasant process. Um, but from what I remember, there are about three sessions before the diagnosis. Um, the first one was kind of an initial assessment with me, just asking basic questions. There was a meeting with my parents, which was held over Skype because they lived quite far away, where they asked questions about my childhood. And then I did a, what's it called? Occupational therapy assessment where they would get me to do various tasks and observe me. And that was the final one. And before I went to any of these sessions, I also had to answer some very comprehensive questionnaires, as did my parents, and these got sent in for analysis. And a few months after those three sessions were completed, I then had a outcome meeting, which was the meeting where I was told my diagnosis and given a big wad of paper explaining my diagnosis. So I found it incredibly traumatic and I really did not enjoy the process at all. The initial kind of meeting one wasn't too bad. Um, it was a little bit triggering to talk about a lot of the negative aspects of my life because that is what they focus on. Uh, and I didn't really enjoy the fact that my parents had to be involved in the whole process, but they were insistent because to be diagnosed with autism, it has to have been like, the signs have to have been present since you were a child, even if the signs kind of flew under the radar. So that's why my parents were involved. I didn't feel totally comfortable about it, but whatever. <laughs> 
The final one is what was really, really upsetting for me because it felt very infantilizing, which is very common in the treatment of people with autism. And what I really struggled with is I was asked to do things like playing with children's toys. Like I had to um, play with blocks and I had to like make shapes out of blocks. I was asked to act out like children's plays and things like that. And it just felt, everything was very child focused. I didn't like it. And I did actually complain to the diagnosis center afterwards that I felt like it was inappropriate for adults to be put through that uh, and they basically just dismissed my concerns and said no one else had ever complained before so but yeah that was the process I really hated it because when I got my actual diagnosis as well I got given a 14 page document which basically explained why they thought I was autistic by explaining all of the things that were wrong about me and it was very much framed in a way that it was all wrong and different in a bad way and uh, struggles deficits those were the kind of wording they used and yeah wasn't wasn't great so yeah uh, I don't want to scare people off from getting a diagnosis because getting a diagnosis can be incredibly valuable but do look into what the process is before you go down that route and just mentally prepare yourself for it the next question on diagnosis is what did diagnosis change for you on a practical level, having a diagnosis means that I can access a lot more support than I can without a diagnosis. I was very lucky that my GP at the time was incredibly, incredibly supportive. She was an absolute angel and she basically I scored so highly. She said to me, look, you're definitely autistic. I just can't diagnose it and put it in your records but you are so she agreed to send a letter to my university and say she is autistic I just can't formally diagnose it please can you provide interim support and my university was very lovely and said yes they could so I did actually get all of the support before my official diagnosis but having the official diagnosis meant that they couldn't then like back charge me for it so it meant I could access lots of different support at university and that's what I'll talk to you about first. So just off the top of my head, once you are formally diagnosed with a disability, even if this happens during your time at university, you get referred to disability services. So a lot of people who are disabled and going to university will have encountered them before they start university because their disability existed before. But people like me who didn't get their diagnosis until later, and this couldn't happen until I had a formal diagnosis, uh, we don't get to see anyone until um, we get the formal diagnosis. So I had this referral and they send you to a needs assessor and my needs assessor was a lovely, lovely man, absolute angel again, adored him. And he helped me figure out what sort of things I'm struggling with that I perhaps didn't realize that wasn't a normal thing to struggle with. And yeah, he helped me work out what I needed. So he recommended a whole bunch of software to help me, for example, mind mapping software, audio recording and editing software for my lectures. And he got me a screen reader, which I still use today at work. And he also recommended getting me a new laptop, a dictaphone, all of these things, lots and lots of things to help me. He also got me a printer and I got a printing allowance because I needed to print more than other people would to help me process things. So I got all of that. Also, I had a autism specific mentor, which again, I still see today thanks to my lovely workplace paying for her. So what happens was I would get uh, two hours a week with her for mentoring, which is, I guess that's what it says on the tip. She would talk to me about my week and help me to problem solve things and troubleshoot things. And it could be anything from like dealing with my department with me, social life, relationships, cooking, like anxiety, whatever I needed support with that week. And she would help me navigate that with my autism. And then I also got a study skills mentor who happened to be the same mentor for me because we found using it as a blended technique was better for me rather than having two separate people. So she would help me with planning things like revision timetables, how I revise, stuff like that, because I found it very difficult to do that by myself. I also got extra time in exams and I got to go in a separate room by myself um, because I couldn't deal with the noise of an exam room. So yeah, lots of things like that I got practical level and at work having that diagnosis also means that I can access similar levels of support at work so I still have my mentor, I get some extra like provisions and yeah so that's the practical side of things. On a personal side, <laughs> put me into a massive depression spiral and I kind of I feel bad saying that because again I don't want to scare people off from diagnosis but the way my diagnosis was given to me and the way people were talking about autism around me it just wasn't healthy for me and yeah I, I'm still dealing with the emotions of the trauma that happened to me at that time 
and I'm trying to tell myself that getting the diagnosis was a really good thing because it was but yeah it <laughs> it was a traumatic experience so what else can I say on that front really and the final question on diagnosis is what advice would you give to people who have just been diagnosed and want to tell other people this is really hard because uh, I actually got that opportunity taken away from me and what I would say is if you are not autistic if someone tells you they're autistic it's kind of like someone's coming out to you about their sexuality or their gender you have to understand it's not yours to tell and it's not yours to spread so when i was first referred for diagnosis i had people this is before i even got my formal diagnosis who decided to go and tell everybody that we knew so it's very difficult for me because for a lot of people I didn't get the opportunity. The one person I really did get the opportunity with was my boyfriend. So my boyfriend, I started dating him after the diagnosis process had started but I hadn't been formally diagnosed until a few months into our relationship and once I was formally diagnosed I decided it was time to tell him because I didn't want to go through a relationship with him not knowing. So I think at that point we'd been together for about three or four months and I would recommend waiting until you know you can trust someone unless you know you are resilient enough to deal with any kind of rejection or ableism you may get back from them and i would honestly just say just be direct you know i called him we skyped and i just said uh i got a diagnosis today and i'm autistic and he was very lovely about it and that's what i would say is be direct but wait until you know you can trust that person Okay, now we're moving on to relationships. And the first question I thought was very interesting and it was, does being autistic affect you meeting people and making friends with people? Yes. 100% <laughs> yes. This is probably my biggest one. I think it will be a very big one for most people on the spectrum. Yes. <laughs> so the biggest thing that autism affects is communication and interpersonal relationships because it requires so many different parts of your brain and they don't want to cooperate. <laughs> So yeah, I've always struggled with this. I've never really had friends for very long. I tend to have very intense friendships that break down very quickly. It's difficult because it's very difficult to do small talk. I don't, I don't understand small talk. I don't do small talk. What is small talk? It's hard to explain, but yeah, like you'll notice I don't really look into the camera all the time. So I'm not making eye contact with people regularly. And yeah, yeah. I've lost an awful lot of friends and like before my diagnosis I would blame myself and I would feel like I was wrong somehow but now I've been diagnosed and I like reflect back on it I can actually see that a lot of the friends I lost especially during my school years I lost because I was autistic and they didn't know and they didn't accept my differences and that's really hard because I think being autistic you often accidentally upset people it just is a thing that happens because we don't have that rule book I'm actually I'm reading a book at the moment that's um, Own Voices Autism Rep and someone in the book says it feels like everyone else has not been speaking this language for hundreds of years and knows it fluently and I've been given a translation book that's 200 years old and for the wrong language and that that's pretty accurate to me. It feels like everyone else has been given the rule book and I've been given a summary sheet. Like they've been given the 100 page rule book and they've memorized it and I've been given a summary sheet. That's how it feels for everything. So conversation is really hard and yeah, everything is just really difficult with um, communication. And so when I do make friends, I tend to cling on to them quite tightly because yeah, my friends are very valuable to me because once I know someone's gonna accept me exactly as I am, I feel very happy about that. I'm better in work relationships than I am in friendships because in, in workplace they kind of appreciate you being more direct because it saves time and it's more clarity but with friendships they don't appreciate you being more direct because you're expected to be more nuanced, you're expected to be thinking more about feeling than logic. <laughs> so yeah, I do much better in professional relationships than I do in friendships unfortunately. The next question is, do you find that once you start unmasking around people, they no longer want to be friends? So if you didn't know, masking is what autistic people do to kind of like blend in with their environment and with the people they're around. And 
yeah, it's like putting on a mask. You mask your traits, you hide them away, and you act more neurotypical to fit in. And unmasking is when you stop doing that and start being more yourself. And yes, I would say it doesn't feel like masking to me. This is kind of strange because obviously I'm learning all of this language after having been diagnosed at the age of 20, and now I'm trying to apply it to my previous childhood years having not been diagnosed and not knowing that's what I was doing and it's kind of hard because it felt to me like I just came out of my shell but I think now that I look back on it it was unmasking and yeah I found that when I let myself be freer and be more myself people didn't like it and that's when I started to rub people up the wrong way and they wanted me to stay this sweet and mellow little child and not someone who's a bit loud and opinionated and wants to be chatty so yeah i 100 percent have found that when i unmask people don't like me as much but i'm trying not to mask in the first place anymore so that people don't start a friendship they don't want to continue the next question is how does autism affect your relationship with your boyfriend did he know you were autistic when you got together so as i've already said i didn't get diagnosed until three months in and that was when i told him but he did actually tell me when i had that call with him that he had kind of suspected that i might have been autistic for a while because i'd made some comments to him about being sensitive to noise and things like that and he'd kind of put two and two together but he didn't want to broach the topic with me because i was obviously sensitive about it which is really nice i guess it's kind of awkward to explain because because I've gone through so much with him at this point. We've been together for two years and three months in I was diagnosed and went through a lot of traumatic experiences around the diagnosis. So when I was first diagnosed, I didn't want to talk about it. And that probably was quite difficult for him. I didn't like the word autism being used. I didn't want to address it directly. And I'm sure that had a lot of effects. <laughs> so on that kind of side of things, yes. But also just the fact of me being autistic, of course, it affects every aspect of my life. It definitely affects our relationship. But I found there's definitely pros and cons. So a big pro is our communication is really, really great because I don't see the point in beating around the bush. I tell him everything directly and I've told him I'd rather he just tell me everything directly and it means that we know a lot better how each other's feeling so that has been amazing <laughs> like that directness has really really helped our relationship so that is great different situations like it, it, he has to think about me more than he would if I was a neurotypical girlfriend so when he wants to take me places you know he has to explain to me where we're going, what we're going to be doing and expectations because otherwise I'll get very anxious and he has to try and encourage his family to do that as well when they invite me places. So there's lots of things like that that he has to take into consideration. But honestly, like he's a very easygoing boyfriend. When I'm hyper fixating on something, like I want to eat the same meal three weeks in a row, he's like, yeah, cool, whatever. When I want to watch the same film two weeks in a row, he's like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like he just is very easy breezy. So that has been a good matchup in that sense. So yeah, it does affect things in a lot of ways, but luckily I have a very laid back boyfriend, so he's not bothered by it. Next up, we have the questions about daily life. And the first one is, how does autism affect your daily life? So lots of ways. And I could sit here and do a whole separate video about how it affects me, but I will try and give you kind of the major things. And I think the biggest thing for me is hyperfixating. As I've mentioned before, it's a really big issue for me. And it can mean that I end up spending lots of money, binge eating, watching lots of things doing things i shouldn't be doing basically but it can also mean i do really great things so it's kind of hard to explain but <laughs> hyper fixating is like an obsession but it's not constant so movies movies are a big thing for me that i hyper fixate on a lot and i'm trying to think now what my hyper fixation movie is because there's always one but basically i will go through these cycles where i will absolutely adore something and i will want to consume that content over and over and over again and I will just watch it over and over and over. So for example when I was about 18 I think that's when I first watched the box trolls and I watched the box trolls like every day for three four weeks because I, my brain could not get off the topic of the box trolls and it would only want to watch the box trolls and that's the kind of thing where like 
I know a lot of people say that they get this in depression when they their brain tells them that this one thing will cure their depression if they don't do it they don't want to do anything else autism can be like that a lot for me so i can hyperfixate on i only want to eat this certain type of food and if i don't eat that type of food i won't eat which is why i put on weight a lot because often that food is crisps chocolate cocktail sausages you know it's those kind of things so hyperfixating is a big part of my life um I have a lot of lack of impulse control as well, so I end up overspending at times and I end up binge eating. Uh, so, but then again, with impulse control, it also means that I do kind of take risks here and there that are good for me. You know, I'll take the plunges in that email that makes me nervous, so that can be really good. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. I think I'm asking, someone's asking a question about work later, so I'm gonna try not to talk about work in this bit. But what else can I tell you about? So I guess we can talk about sensory things because senses are very heightened or dulled. So basically everything is a spectrum. And the way you can kind of think of autism is less of a linear spectrum and more of like a spider's web with lots of different spectrums coming off of it. And different senses can be either super heightened or super dulled. So most of mine are really heightened. <laughs> I have a very low tolerance for pain because things feel very, very painful to me all the time. And I have a pretty heightened sense of smell, but my biggest one is touch. I'm My biggest heightened sense, I personally think, actually no, it's hearing. My biggest heightened sense is hearing, but second is touch. So a big thing for me is texture um, with food. So as a child, I wouldn't eat mincemeat because I didn't like the texture. I just wouldn't eat it. When my parents made spaghetti bolognese, they used to take the bolognese sauce, like the mince and the peppers and everything like that, and blend it because that's the only way they could get me to eat it. Because I just wouldn't eat the texture of the mince made me feel so ill. And there's still things now that I can't eat because of the texture, like olives. I can't eat olives because they're too rubbery. So like I have to wear earplugs to sleep if my boyfriend is here because I kid you not, his breathing wakes me up. That's how sensitive my sound is, how sensitive my hearing is. Yeah, breathing keeps me awake. So <laughs> it affects everything, absolutely everything. Uh, if you want to know more about that, feel free to ask me more questions in the comments and I can either answer them there or do another video because you would be amazed the things that autism affects. The next question is, does autism affect how you use social media and how social media affects you? This is hard because I would say before my diagnosis, that was kind of the age that I started using social media properly. And before that, I didn't really use social media all that much other than Tumblr. I was a big Tumblr kid back in the day. But yeah, I guess on a communication level, it does. It can be really difficult to understand uh, tone on social media because yeah Twitter especially like it, you you can't read the tone so yes it definitely affects that because people kind of assume everyone knows what tone they're speaking in but I guess that's all text-based communication but other things as well like uh, Instagram stories when people don't caption those I often will have to skip through because I watch everything with subtitles because I can't process fast enough to often keep up with what people are saying and when people don't caption their Instagram stories, sometimes I can't watch them because I can't focus on what they're saying. So yeah, I definitely consume social media differently. I can be obsessive with social media and like want to check it all the time because I'm hyper fixating on it, which isn't great. So yeah, and as how it affects me, I don't know. I don't know how it affects other people. That's the thing. I don't know how I would be different. And the final question in the daily life section is, how does working from home help you? Now, the person asking this did actually say the reason they asked me is because they'd seen me tweet previously saying that I feel guilty about enjoying working from home and not wanting the world to go back to normal because it is so much better for me as an autistic person. And they wanted some clarity on what sort of things are better for me. And I'm so glad someone asked me this because I really like talking about this. And basically, Working from home, and this will be similar for a lot of people, but it's just more intense for disabled people. But working from home means that I can personalise my work environment to make it 
tailored to me and my specific needs and nobody else. So it's little things like in a, say in an office, I would have to be sat against the wall on the end of a row if it was a bank of computers because if I'm in the middle or if there's anyone behind me I won't be able to focus. I'd have to wear noise cancelling headphones all day long because any kind of noise will f be very distracting for me. So at home I can sit in my comfy desk chair in my bedroom which is where my desk is and I can keep the environment quiet, I can play anything I need to help me keep focused, I can have my stim toys to hand like <laughs> my squeezy cat burger, not very professional for an office environment, but definitely okay for my bedroom. So it's really good in that sense. And yeah, it just means I can personalize things so much better. The lighting is better for me. You know, I have softer lighting in my bedroom than you would have in an office because those like bright office lights hurt my head so much. And yeah, it's just, everything is so much better tailored to me. And that's what it's like. So. Yeah, I am actually now going to be pursuing careers where I can work from home, which is why I'm on a graduate scheme and I go on placements. So my next placement, I'm trying to get a programming placement so I can become a programmer in the future and work from home. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely going down the work from home path in the future because it is just so much better for me and my brain. Now I'm moving on to the media section. And this is about, uh, I guess, books, TV, film, those kinds of things and questions related to that. The first question is, did you see yourself reflected in books as a child and do you think it's improving now? Again, this is a difficult one because I wasn't diagnosed as a child, didn't know I was different as a child. So it's really hard. I found I didn't understand why people in books just understood things <laughs> and like why everything was so innate for everybody and I do remember as a kid sitting there thinking well they always seem to know when people are joking so one day when I'm older I'll develop that ability to know when people are joking know what jokes are poor baby me no you will never know when people are joking you just kind of have to guess <laughs> So yeah, I think that definitely kind of points towards no, I didn't see myself in books, but I wasn't consciously aware of it. I thought I would be like these kids one day. And I think anytime there was autism representation in books back when I was a child, it was never a positive thing. <laughs> so yeah, not great. But yes, I would say it's getting better. It's still lagging behind a lot and it's kind of hard to get anybody to care but we're getting there. Slowly and surely we're getting there. You know, um, I'm gonna give this, <laughs> take this opportunity to shout out some amazing creators. If you want some own voices middle grade, go and check out Elle McNichol's book, A Kind of Spark. I absolutely loved, and that one's already out and coming out soon is Show Us Who You Are. And I'm reading that at the moment because I have a review copy and it is just amazing. So yeah, if you want some middle grade, um, check out Elle McNichol. If you want some non-fiction, there's Dara McNulty, who has written Diary of Young Naturalist, which is his diaries. <laughs> and he's autistic and a teenager, and that's really amazing. There's also Stim, which is an autistic anthology edited by Hux, who's Lizzie Huxley-Jones. And then if you want some adult romance, I would go and check out The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang because that is a Own Voices adult romance and it's quite steamy. And there's also the Brown Sister series by Talia Hibbert. Get, uh, what's it called? Um, the last one, Eve Brown. Whatever the Eve Brown title is, I'm sorry, I forget them. But the Eve Brown book is an on-page named autistic character. So that's the third book, but you can read them out of order. So those are the ones I have read and would recommend to you, but there are so many more now out there and that makes me so, so happy. If you want more recommendations, I will link below and up in the cards my video where I talk about autism representation in books and give you some recommendations. Now, I accidentally overlapped with the next question, but it is, what are your favourite autistic books and why? So yes, my favourites, the ones I just listed, The Kiss Quotient, I absolutely loved. And Show Us Who You Are is definitely going to be a new favourite for me. And A Kind of Spark by Elle McNichol is also great. Yeah, I'm just looking at my shelves now and they're amazing. I Those are definitely my three favourites, I think. So yeah, 
And like I said, I will link that video if you want to go and watch me talk about them a bit more. The next question is, which characters do you headcanon as autistic and why? None. I'm gonna say, uh, honestly, I still feel like I don't know enough about my own autism to be able to look at someone else and be like, yeah, they're autistic. So yeah, I haven't really, I guess the closest for me would be Sherlock in the TV series Sherlock, the one played by Benedict Cumberbatch, because he definitely seems like he could be. But yeah, other than that, I don't really think there's anyone I have consciously had canoned. And that neatly leads us on to the next two questions which I've combined, which is what are your thoughts on how autism is portrayed in films and TV and have you seen any good portrayals of autism in the media? So, <laughs> to answer the question, the second question, not really. I have kind of avoided autism in TV and film because I find it mostly triggering and I do tend to wait until another autistic person tells me it's good and so far none of the ones on my radar have been any good so sadly no <laughs> it tends to be written by neurotypicals or especially by neurotypicals who have autistic family and friends who feel like they should tell a story for us and it just becomes very over exaggerated and stereotyped so yeah no it doesn't seem to ever be that great but i do have hope that it will get better um i do find as well that it's often portrayed as something incredibly negative and it's a burden and a struggle and there's nothing positive about it and it needs to be cured or taken away and yeah i just the media needs to get with it because if they kind of portrayed queer people or people of colour in the way that they portray autistic people, there'd be riots. So I really hope they start listening to us eventually. But you know, music by Sia got nominated for a Golden Globe, so we're not there yet. And now finally we're moving on to the more general questions that I couldn't place. The first question is, what is a myth you want to clear up or some common misconceptions that you would like to clear up? And I'm going to just quick fire them because I think they're things that people just forget. The one thing that I really wish people would remember is autistic people grow up. Yes, we're, some of us are adults. Some of us are completely functioning independent adults. Oh my god, I live alone. I function by myself. I have a full time job. I pay all my own bills and I look after my cat. We grow up, we can be functional adults, like we don't all stay children, we're not all high support needs, there's a wide variety. The other one is, yes, girls can be autistic. And just because a lot of us aren't diagnosed until adulthood, it doesn't mean that we're faking or that we only became autistic in adulthood. It means that society pressured us to mask more than they pressured boys to mask more. And that's why we get missed in childhood. I'm trying to think, I got really mad and I forgot what I wanted to myth bust. Typical me. <laughs> um, other common autism myths. Oh, we're not all savants. Uh, we don't all have one special interest that stays the same. And we're not all amazing at STEM subjects and maths and things like that. Like everyone has different interests. Um, what else? There's just so many misconceptions. We have emotions, we feel empathy, we really do. In fact, we're more likely to feel too much empathy, which is the category I fall into. Can you imagine? Like, so I'm trying to explain like the empathy side of things. So imagine somebody tells you that their loved one is ill and you feel like, oh, that's sad. I feel sorry for them. Times that feeling by like 10 that's the level i experience it on and it can be very intense so yeah we definitely feel empathy and we often just feel too much empathy i can't actually like uh what read thrillers very often because i get so anxious reading them because i feel so anxious for the characters so yeah <laughs> take that if you will but yeah we, we we have feelings we have empathy for sure the next question is, what do you wish allistic people knew about autism? 
honestly quite a lot. I kind of wish we could swap brains for a day so we could both see how differently our brains operate, especially so that holistic people could see how my brain works. I think the biggest thing I want them to know is it's not a choice and that I don't want to be difficult or anything like that and when I get distressed it's not because I'm being difficult or being or choosing to be like that it's because it is distressing me um things like schedule and last minute changes are so important to me like I can't deal with last minute schedule changes at all because it's just so stressful and so like you know especially as a kid you know people thought I was just being difficult and trying to get in my own way when I'd have meltdowns over going to a different restaurant than what we'd planned but really it's because my brain just couldn't handle that change in the plan so yeah I think that's what I wish people knew is that like we're not kicking up a fuss because we want to we're kicking up a fuss because it's the only thing our brain knows to do when we are in distress like that the next question is what do you wish people had known to help you as a child and this was asked by a parent who wants to help their child and I think that's an amazing question that they're asking and I would definitely encourage them anytime an autistic person offers to answer questions ask this question because everyone will have different answers and I guess listen to my previous question and answer where I said like it's not a choice because yeah the meltdowns aren't a choice and the frustrations and the anxieties aren't a choice it can be very difficult for us and just being that kind and like comforting presence and just being gentle with us is really what's the most important thing and trying to advocate for your child but not speak over your child is a big thing for me I found a lot of the time that people would want to speak for me when I got overwhelmed and that kind of led to things not going how I would have wanted them to go it's really difficult because I, yeah, I was a very difficult child to deal with because nobody knew I was autistic and they thought I was just being naughty. So I think knowing your child is autistic is a big first step. And I think trying to understand how it manifests for them is really, really important. And to understand what their needs are and like remembering that schedule is probably going to be really important and sticking to routines and schedules is going to be amazing. And like, I wish when I asked for details of what was going to be happening that was answered more because it was so stressful to not know plans and expectations expectations is probably the biggest thing and also understanding that food is a completely different experience for us because our senses are so heightened or dulled so you know some autistic people love really really strong flavors because their sense of taste is really dulled and others like really really bland food because their taste is so heightened so i think it's just adapting and understanding that these things aren't a choice for us next question is what are your current special interests and have they changed over your life they 100 percent have when i was little my special interest was scooby-doo and like i find it it's really awkward but Anytime something's my special interest, it's like mine. And anytime anyone else tries to say that like they are obsessed with it, I'm like, no, that's my thing. Like Scooby-Doo is my thing. Mulan is my thing. Moana is my thing. Those have all been like, Scooby-Doo was the most intense special interest I think I've ever had. And that lasted for a really long time, <laughs> like years. And I still have a really soft spot for Scooby-Doo, definitely, for sure. Uh, the new TV series where they've got Shaggy and Velma dating is just blasphemy and I refuse to watch it. But yeah, <laughs> that was my strongest one as a child. I would then say as a teenager it kind of shifted to being Harry Potter. So that was my biggest one. I was properly, properly obsessed for a really long time on that one. But I think since turning like 17, 18, they've become looser and I think this is quite common for um, autistic adults is that they kind of become broader and less intense and you tend to have more like multiple special interests and hyperfixations than one but I know lots of adults do have one special interest but right now I don't really have one um you know people keep telling me that books are my special interest but they're really not they're just a hobby that I enjoy I think that's important to remember not every hobby that an autistic person enjoys is their special interest or a special interest I think right now it's probably actually Blackpink I'm obsessed with them it's the only music I listen to I will read anything I see about them I will like my Instagram like discover whatever it's called is just full of 
Blackpink fan accounts. I don't follow any of them, but that's all that comes up. So yeah, that's probably my current, the closest thing I have right now to a special interest, but it shifts a lot now that I'm an adult. So I kind of call them hyperfixations more than uh, special interests because yeah, they shift. They can last for months or weeks or even days. Uh, Blackpink has lasted for a while actually, since I watched the documentary back in like November, but yeah, they do change a lot and I have a lot of different ones over time. So yeah, and not everyone has special interests. Not everyone does. Uh, mine have always varied a lot. And yeah, I, I, I struggle to pinpoint them. I don't think, even my, my autism mentor has said that she doesn't think I have one specific special interest. I just have lots of more intense interests. <sighs> now the final question is actually the most difficult one for me. And that is, what are the best parts about being autistic? This is really hard because as I said, like during my diagnosis and the months following, and even the months before, there was a lot of focus on the negativity of autism and it's kind of traumatized me. And I definitely have more of a negative outlook on my own autism. And I'm working really, really hard to change that. I think because it was all focused on you're deficient in all of these social things that I really struggle with it. So yeah, I, I can definitely point out some positive things. I like being hyper fixated in things. And like, I love that I love Blackpink as intensely as I do. I love that, you know, I love reading as much as I do. I really, really love that when I like a thing, I really, really like a thing because I get so much enjoyment out of it. And I love having those hobbies and those interests that are really intense. I do like that. And it can be helpful in workplace situations at times because being able to hyper focus is really helpful when you're doing long and arduous tasks. So yeah, and like I said, in my relationship, being very direct with communication has been really, really helpful. So there's definitely some really good parts. I think if I was to say a best part, it's definitely the um, intense interests and intense hobbies that I like the best because yeah, I just get so much joy out of my hobbies and things that I like doing. So <laughs> this is an incredibly long video, I'm sure, but thank you so much. And I really, really hope you've made it to the end. I have really enjoyed making this and I'm happy to do it again if you have any follow-up questions. So yeah, I, I really hope this is interesting to you all and that you've learned a bit more about me and how I navigate the world. And like, yeah, I keep saying this, but if you have more questions, please just put them down in the comments below. And I'm really sorry, I've been really bad at looking to the camera today, but when I'm like struggling to, to function, that's what happens. So this is kind of um, a stressful video for me to film, so yeah <laughs> but thank you so much for asking these questions and also just thank you for letting me be me <laughs> and being so open and just autistic on my channel and on bookish internet spaces without judgment and without telling me that it's wrong it it just it's it's pretty amazing and oh don't get emotional you've got makeup on <laughs> it's just it's just really nice to feel accepted for who I am on here because I've never really felt that before and, oh no <laughs> oh, yeah no it's just been really nice that since I started being more open about being autistic that people on here have been so kind to me and I've developed kind of a community and made friends with people and I understand my own autism better <laughs> because people have been so kind and so welcoming and so warm. Um, yeah, I would want to say an extra special thank you to Emma from Emma Novella for being so kind to me during the Finding Sam thing and for being my like I know we're not particularly close but just being a friend I can DM has been very helpful <laughs> thank you Emma that's been amazing but also thank you to like Ben and Livy who are my like closest internet pals um you guys are great <laughs> I like that I could just be me um yeah I really appreciate how kind everyone has been and uh, yeah I had a feeling I was going to cry in this video so I didn't put mascara on and I was right. <laughs>
Whew. Thank you guys. Uh, oh god, what's my outro? <laughs> um thank you so much for watching if you like this video please give it a like and consider subscribing to see more content from me um oh gosh sorry <laughs> that's really emotional all of my social media links are down in the description below if you want to leave me a comment to let me know that you are here please leave me a frog emoji because i might be getting frogs soon and i'd like to see frogs um <laughs> Oh, I think that's all the things I'm supposed to say. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments if this video is good and if you have any other questions. So, yeah. Thank you. Bye.